Hello, hello, and how are you, my friends? I'm Peter, and here I'm telling you stories about the most interesting European cars of the 80s and 90s. Today we are talking about a car with an interesting history combining three great names in the British automotive industry together. This is the story of Aston Martin DB7, produced between 1994 and 2004. However, its history started not with Aston Martin, but with Jaguar and Ford. So, here is the disposition at the beginning of the 90s. Ford Motor Company has just bought Aston Martin and Jaguar. Both companies had a great history and brand value, but were struggling financially as the whole British automotive industry at that time. Jaguar had a very good and successful GT car Jaguar XGS, a really cool sport coupe, but it was launched in the middle of the 70s and was very outdated, frankly speaking, for the 90s. The engineers and designers of Jaguar wanted to build a new modern car on the platform of XJS. So they developed a concept named XJ41-42 with the design created by Keith Helfet. But the manager of Ford decided to cancel this project because the car became too heavy in comparison with XJS and because the whole development was way too expensive. This could be the end of the story. But here another important person appears in the story, a famous Scottish racing driver, Tom Walkinshaw. He used to drive racing versions of Jaguar XGS in the past and was dreaming to give this car a new revival with a new modern body on the updated platform of the XJS. When he learned that Ford decided to abandon the revival project, he stepped in and asked the car designer Ian Callum to develop an updated project of this car. The technical part was engineered by the racing team of Walking Show, TWR, don't mistake it with TVR brand. Tom Walking Show later showed this new basically a completed project to managers of Jaguar and Ford, and the project was fully rejected. This could be another end of the story, but at the time Walter Hayes, the CEO of Aston Martin, approached Tom Walking Show with the idea to produce the car under Aston Martin brand. Aston Martin at that time manufactured only one very expensive Vierage model with its variation Vantage. I have a video about them on this channel. Walter Hayes wanted to add another car into his product range. So Tom Walkinshaw asked Ian Cowan to design an updated version of the car with Aston Martin design features, such as distinctive appearance of the front grille. When the car was introduced to the managers of Ford, they were not happy because they didn't want to spend resources reserved for the development of Jaguar X220. But Harris and Walking Show convinced them that the new car would attract a lot of new customers to Aston Martin, and they finally agreed. So Ford presented the concept of the project at the Geneva Motor Show at the beginning of 1993. The car received great appreciation from the public and was greenlighted for production under the name Aston Martin DB7. The car was positioned as an entry-level Aston Martin. It had an inline-six engine instead of V8 installed on Virages. It had a steel body instead of aluminum one traditional for Aston Martin. In fact, it was the first and the last Aston Martin with a fully steel body and frame. The car was a quid cheaper than Virage and was factory manufactured instead of traditionally hand-built other models of Aston Martin. Many parts were borrowed from other Ford-related cars, from Mazda, partly owned by Ford, and from Ford Scorpio. The side mirrors were from Citroën A6, and the platform itself was the platform of the good old Jaguar XJS, although with many updates. And the price of the car was set to make it an entry-level Aston Martin and to attract new customers to the brand. It was considered rather affordable. Well, affordable compared to other Aston Martins, of course. In the United States, the hardtop coupe was sold for $140,000 and the convertible volante for $150,000. In modern money, it is about $300,000. So the affordability of this car for the general public was rather relative. But this worked, and the DB7 was sold in the quantity of 7000 units, which made it the best-selling Aston Martin in history at that time. As I already said, the DB7 was available in two bodies, both with two doors and four seats, a hard-top coupe and a convertible named DB7 Volante. 
Aston Martin traditionally uses Volante names for convertibles. By the way, how do you pronounce the word coupé? There are two versions in dictionaries, French-British coupé and more American coupe. I traditionally use coupé version, and which one do you use? Tell me please in the comments below, which version should I use in my videos? All DB7 had four seats, but frankly speaking there wasn't any real space for the passengers on the rear seats, even for kids. So I would consider them as two-seaters, with additional space for a purse. Or for a cat. Or for a very small dog who isn't afraid of small enclosed spaces. It is interesting that the production history of Aston Martin DB7 may be divided into two very different parts considering the situation with the engines. At first, only one inline 6-cylinder 3.2-liter engine was available. Remember, it was an entry-level Aston Martin. However, the power of this small-ish engine with a supercharger was not that bad – 335 horsepower. The top speed of the coupe with the 5-speed manual gearbox was 266 km per hour or 165 miles per hour with 0 to 60 miles per hour in 5.7 seconds. Very, very good even today. With the 4-speed automatic transmission, the coupe could reach 257 km per hour or 160 miles per hour with 0 to 60 in 6.9 seconds. Still not bad. The Volante convertible, both manual and automatic, had a top speed of 249 km per hour or 155 miles per hour. 0 to 60 time for Volante was 6 seconds for the manual and 6.6 .6 seconds for the automatic version. In 1999, a new 12-cylinder engine was introduced to DB7. Aston Martin at the time decided to phase out the Virage V8 and Vantage models. So, DB7 was promoted from the entry-level position to the top-of-the-line level. And the new 5.9-liter engine with 48 valves was intended to support this promotion together with the new model name – DB7 Vantage. This engine had 420 horses inside and made 296 km per hour or 184 miles per hour with the new 6-speed manual gearbox. The 5-speed automatic version, also with new transmission, was limited to 266 km per hour or 165 miles per hour. The 0 to 60 miles per hour times were 5 seconds for the manual coupe, 5.9 for the automatic coupe, the same 5.9 for the manual Volante, and 5.2 seconds for Volante with automatic transmission. The production of the 6-cylinder engine was ended in the middle of 1999. In 2002, another version of the V12 engine appeared on DB7 Coupe. Also with 5.9 liters, it produced 15 more horsepower, 435 in total, and was offered with 6-speed manual transmission only. This car received the name DB7 V12 Vantage GT and had a seriously updated suspension and brakes and also many distinctive design elements, such as a mesh front grille, vents in the hood, a trunk spoiler, an aluminum gear lever, optional carbon fiber interior trim, and new wheels. The Volante convertible version of this special series received the name DB7 V12 Vantage GTA, where the letter A stands for automatic, because this car was available with the automatic transmission only. And the engine of the GTA was the same as on a regular Volante, but the car had the same updates in the suspension and design as the GT. The GT and GTA versions of the DB7 are very rare because they were produced only 190 GTs and 112 GTAs. The DB7 also had other special limited editions. For example, Alfred Dunhill edition of 1998 with 78 silver platinum metallic cars with a built-in humidor. Nyman Marcus edition of 1998. Stratstone edition of 1999. Anniversary edition of 2003 with 55 blue cars celebrating the end of the production of the DB7. There were several other special editions, but the most interesting ones in my opinion were made in a collaboration with Italian body design company Zagata, the Aston Marty DB7 Zagata of 2002 and DB AR1 of 2003, where AR1 stands for American Roadster 1. 
Both cars were produced in the number of 100 units, with one car from each edition made for the Aston Martin Museum. The DB7 Zagata had a steel body designed together by Andrea Zagata at Zagata and the chief designer of Aston Martin, Henrik Fisker, and featured the signature double bubble Zagata roofline. It was only offered in the UK, Europe and Southeast Asia. It had an updated V12 engine increased to 6 liters with 435 horny ponies and the top speed of 299 km per hour or 186 miles per hour and 0 to 60 acceleration in 4.9 seconds. The DB AR1 with a topless body was based on the DB7 Volante and was only offered in the United States. By its idea, the AR1 was intended for southern sunny American states and had no roof of any kind at all. The engine and output were almost the same as in DB7 Zagata, with minor differences. Also, the owners of DB7 could use the services of Aston Martin's in-house tuning shop, Work Services, to upgrade, modify and personalize their cars. For example, it is known that Work Service built at least one DB7 with the V8 engine from the famous VRH 6.3. It is interesting to mention that after the success of Aston Martin DB7, the management of Ford changed their opinion on the revival of Jaguar XJS and launched a car on the same platform under the name Jaguar XK. The Jaguar XK was offered with several V8 engines, which was never an option for standard Aston Martin DB7s. But the XK never had the V12 engine of Aston Martin. At the same time, these cars are very close to each other and many parts are interchangeable between them. And this is good news for the owners of the DB7s, because the same parts under the Jaguar brand may cost several times less than the parts with Aston Martin logo on the packaging. However, the cars are different in many aspects, and the DB7s have many parts that are unique to them. We will speak about the Jaguar XK separately someday. But for now, the question that customers may face is the choice between the XK and the DB7, and the answer is not obvious at all. On the one hand, the Jaguar XK may be a little more reliable, especially in comparison with 6-cylinder DB7s. On the other hand, the V12 engine, a really good one, can be found on DB7s only. But Jaguar's parts are cheaper and therefore the maintenance as well. However, when you answer the question, what car are you driving? There is a huge difference between the answers Jaguar and Aston Martin, even if you have just a simple six-cylinder Aston Martin. So the choice is difficult, and everyone should make it for themselves. There were some concerns about the quality of the DB7, especially for earlier made cars, but frankly speaking, most British cars of that time may face these concerns. So, if you really want to be a part of the classic British luxury, you should accept some drawbacks common to this area. These cars are not about reliability, they are about styling and the feeling of the aristocracy. At the same time, the owners and testers report the DB7 as a very cool car to drive. It has undoubtful power and dynamics. It drives well, it handles corners greatly, it accelerates perfectly and it sounds awesome. It may be not the most luxurious and comfortable car, but it is a car for a driver. It is based on the platform that has a glorious racing history, and this platform was updated and improved by some of the best British racing engineers of the 90s. So this car is really great to drive, especially with V12. And the pricing for DB7s now is very attractive. These cars lost a lot of their value from the time of their production. It is bad for their first owners, and it's great for you if you'd like to buy one of them now. But they started to grow in price, because people started to get to know them, and the offering is shrinking. Just a couple of years ago, you could buy a good example of the DB7 with a V12 engine for just $30,000 in the United States. Now they are closer to $50,000, and will raise more, I suspect. So, if you want one, do not wait. Unfortunately, you still cannot import the V12 DB7 to the US from Europe because they are younger than 25 years. But you can import many of 6-cylinder DB7s to the United States if they are older than 25 years. The DB7 was sold in the US during the time of its production, 
so you can find a good example in the country. But if you want more choices and probably lower prices, you should take a look on the European market. In the UK, you can buy the 6-cylinder DB7 in good condition with rather low mileage for 17 to 30,000 British pounds. In continental Europe, the price will be around 30 to 50,000 euros, depending on the year, condition and mileage. You maybe can find better offer if you search deeper and have someone with good connections in Europe. And by the way, if you'd like to buy the DB7 or any other car from Europe and import it to the United States, I probably can help you with this. Check out our website for all details by the link in the description under this video. Well, thank you very much for watching. So, what are you thinking about Aston Martin DB7? Would you like to drive it? Or maybe you had one? Tell me please about your experience in the comments below. And if you like this video, please give me thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much my friends and see you next time.